What's going on, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the first ever episode of Eat, Speak, Compete, our podcast here where we're going to talk about everything going on in the esports and gaming world. I am your host, Yeso, and my co-host here joining me, the man, the myth, the legend himself, Luke Shimonahe Brew. Uh, happy Monday, my man. How are we doing? Good. It's Monday. We're on our first episode. Eat, speak, compete. Yes. Name, incredible. Logo, even better. Yes. So yes. it's, uh, it's you know, exciting just to, you know, start a new thing. Just figured we'd chat with our, you know, our, our standard audience. You know, there's a lot of people who, you know, follow what Esports Arena does. And we do a lot in, you know, various gaming communities. But it's kind of cool just to have a, you know, a standard spot where you can kind of go and just kind of catch up on all the different news and whatnot. There's definitely, you know, some outlets out there. But again, just for people within our ecosystem that, you know, kind of follow through everything that we got going on, it's cool just to kind of get some, um, I guess, additional point of views from, you know, mm -hmm. people on the business side, people who, you know, run a lot of events on that end. And um, yeah, so I mean, I'm just guess, excited to chat and talk to the people. Yeah. And so if you guys ever feel like there's topics that you guys want us to discuss if you ever have questions anything like that and you want to get our feedback on the show uh please feel free to reach out to both of us on twitter at any time uh, i'm at caster yeso luke is at shimonahi on twitter we'd love to hear from you guys uh appreciate you know everybody watching here for the first time uh if you are listening or watching uh we will be on soundcloud and the plan is to eventually come out to all of your regular podcast platforms Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all that good stuff. And we will keep you guys updated on when we are on those platforms. And also, if you want to check out the VOD and see our beautiful faces, see the gorgeous studio that we get to hang out in, uh, you can just check us out on YouTube. Look up uh, Esports Arena on YouTube and find the latest episodes of Eat, Speak, Compete over there. But let's get into what we're here to talk about. We got uh, a range of awesome things today. Uh, most recent results in the LCS, some big things happening around the Overwatch League and some big business stuff in the Smash community as well. A lot to talk about today, but let's start with the LCS. We are right in the thick of things with the LCS playoffs. For real. Another weekend done here uh, over the past few days. We saw C9 moving on in the lower bracket. Uh, we saw Team Liquid beating TSM, a huge win there. Uh, Hunter Thieves moving on, grabbing their spot at Worlds. Um, and one thing I wanted to highlight is with the way the bracket worked out, we had TSM, Cloud9, and Team Liquid all on the same side of the bracket. And what that means is that one of those teams is guaranteed to not go to Worlds. We could technically have two of them not going to Worlds. And just for some highlights in terms of money, Perks on Cloud9 had a $5 million buyout and a $2.7 million salary. You've got Jensen and Alfari both make over a million dollars per year. And then Sword Art, the support for TSM, makes three million dollars a year so that's a lot of money invested and at least one of those squads that spent millions on these big name players is not going to china in october there's a lot to unpack there i don't even know where to start first, <laughs> first thing i Take would say pick. first thing i would say is just result wise like it was crazy mm -hmm. like it was just like domination it was like it was an even matchup 3-0 yeah it was like they're not even close reverse 3-0 yeah. and it was just like it, the results didn't make any sense which I hate to see in a league like this, right? Because especially when you're when you're when it's these these caliber of players, mm -hmm. right? And they're getting paid this caliber of money, and it's like the results vary like that much. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's just like in a it's just like in a league. It's just like so. You know, I I remember having a conversation with one of the the pro orgs and their team, and I like was trying to die, like break down like their training regimens and all these different things. And mm -hmm. one of the things that really resided with me that I've never been able to get out of my head. Is the fact that they basically told me that a lot of LCS rosters like refused to even scrim with like academy teams because like if I'm getting paid a million dollar salary, <laughs> I am not scrimming with somebody who's making like 15 bucks an hour. Like there's no way because what happens if I lose? Do you know what I mean? So yeah. it's like it just it, it's just the, it's the training regiments of, of North America just have to just they're not there at all. And you can that totally shows even just in our own league and let alone when we go to worlds and attempt to play against the actual god squads who yeah. you know actual rosters are made up of these million dollar players yeah it, it's gonna be not that jensen's not a million dollar player i'm just for saying sure. i'm just saying in general like and i mean it, to for for reference with the results of this weekend 
uh, Team Liquid and 100 Thieves actually both officially qualify for Worlds. So they're both guaranteed to go no matter how things finish off. Obviously, the seeding to be determined based on how playoffs finish, but they are both confirmed going. And, and the others are in the last chance qualifier or Masters or so whatever it's it called. So actually, the way it used to work, right, is you had your summer winner went, you had then whoever didn't win summer but had the most circuit points went, and then you had a, a regional qualifier, that LCQ, for the third spot. It has changed now yeah. to where it is just the top three in summer. Oh, okay. Top three in summer, go. So since Liquid and 100 Thieves both made winner's finals, they're both guaranteed top three. Now it's just whoever takes that. And then it's that lower off. bracket. And down there, uh, we're sitting with TSM's down there, Evil Geniuses is down there, uh, C9, and one team who I am forgetting right now. But that's what they're calling Masters. The Masters, like... No, that's Valorant, uh, the, the World oh. Championship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We will get to Valorant. We are going to talk some Valorant esports because there's some, been some big stuff happening over there. But that's just the lower bracket cool. for the LCS Summer Playoffs. And the way it kind of plays out is that since, you know, you don't do circuit points anymore because the way they make spring matter is that you carry over that record now, right? Sure. We talk, we've talked about it before where you started summer with whatever your record was from spring and then that affects how you get seeded for playoffs. And then um, it would reset. Yeah. For and example, like 100 Thieves had a solid spring uh, split, great summer split, so they got a top four placing, and all they had to do was win a single best of five to qualify for Worlds. They did it. Easy 3-1, right? 3-2, uh, one. One. actually. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That one was 3-2. It should have been a 3-1. I specifically was watching that series on uh, Saturday. I'm watching game four. I had to go to my... I'm going to my parents for dinner. So I'm watching the game. I'm driving to my parents' house. I have it playing, like, on my phone in the car, and once I pull up to the house... 100 Thieves gets, like, the second Baron. They're crushing it. I turn it off. I'm like, cool. 100 Thieves is going to Worlds, going to the house. I'm hanging out with my parents. And 20 minutes later, I just offhanded, like, check Twitter. Like, oh, what's going on? And everybody's like, oh, my what God, is Danny, going Danny. On? And I was like, what? And Danny is the rookie AD carry for Evil Geniuses. And it turned out he had, like, a pop-off quadra kill mm. to turn Love the game around. I was it. like, how did 100 Thieves lose this game? And then they went to game five and they just banned his Tristana and then bodied him in game five. So, like, thankfully they, they made it. But uh, that was crazy. But the, the interesting one was Team Liquid. And you talk about turning results kind of on their head. Liquid has been kind of a dumpster fire this season. Their coach left. Bunch of different roster changes. I mean, they dropped their all-star top laner to Academy after, uh, I think, the first day of play in summer. And had their academy uh, rookie come up and play. And then Santorin was out for health issues. They finally get, like, the full roster together and playing now in playoffs. And they've looked like a completely different animal. And they bodied TSM. And now, and now you look at TSM and they've got, you know, Cloud9, Evil Geniuses, these big squads ahead of them that they've got to compete with now to get that final spot of Worlds. And it's going to be a very interesting run these last few weeks of playoffs. I'm certainly excited about it. We'll see how it goes. Yeah, it's going to be fun. That is what's going on in the LCS world. Hope you guys are enjoying those playoffs. What we want to talk about next, though, Luke mentioned it. He was talking about Masters, and that was Valorant. Mm. We had the North American Challengers Stage 3 playoffs go down just this past week, and Sentinels crushed They're it. They're so good. They, they, right, they, won, uh, they won the first international uh, Masters a couple of months ago, the first official international LAN uh, in Valorant, that was huge. Tens popped off. They have actually since officially signed tens to the roster. They go into playoffs this time. They only dropped two out of the 11 total maps, and specifically in both series they played against 100 Thieves, they go 5-1 in map score. They qualify. They're going to Masters in Berlin, and they seem... Uh, I don't believe they have locked uh, world, uh, like the World Championship yet, but if they do win... Masters, I believe they, uh, they should lock it, but it was just crazy. I mean, they were they were dominant and look just a cut above everybody else in North America. Which I would say in this situation again doesn't mean too much because I feel like North America is pretty low on the on the, uh, the the totem pole for Valorant for sure. Like I don't know because I mean, hey, they won the first international tournament, right? Wrong, With yeah. some really good teams, I think there's definitely. Uh, the competition is going to be higher. 
uh, super massive blaze uh, from Turkey actually just qualified through the EMBA playoffs today. Yep. This morning. Uh, we're, yeah, we're Way recording. It is uh, Monday, August 16th yeah. today as we're recording. So Supermassive just qualified today. They beat G2 2-0 to grab their spot. So that's huge. Um, and Supermassive actually looks like an incredible team. So I am I think we're going to get some more questions answered on kind of where the different regions stand uh, in Berlin very soon. Um, and that's definitely going to set the stage for champions in, and I believe that's in November because I yep. think they have it scheduled to follow up the World Championships for League of Legends. And it's gonna be a crazy month or two. I'm, I'm so excited. <laughs> I mean, Worlds is like October is my favorite time of year because we get the World Championships for League. I'm obviously a hockey guy, and that's when the hockey season starts for the NHL. So I'm very much in my happy place in October. But I'm excited for Berlin because I have so many questions. And I feel like I'm going to get a lot of answers, and it's going to be really fun to see some of these top teams getting after it at another international land. I agree. I can't say I'm a huge Sentinels fan in general, but I am excited to see the Sentinels roster. Just like, do you have a Valorant there. team that you're like behind? I know the scene is fairly young, mm. and I yeah, know I mean, you're I'm, with kind of the position you occupy in the business. You're you interact with so many different teams. Yeah. I would say not really too much. Like I, again, like it's it's hard because the rosters I feel like are still kind of up in the air and always yeah. changing. So I feel like it's kind of been hard for me to zone in on a specific roster that I really like. I mean, TSM's always fun to follow. Like I always root for TSM because mm -hmm. you know they're they're always like a mixture between the all stars and the the big old memers. So yeah. it's just like a blast to follow their team as always. Um, so TSM for sure. I'm an old school LCS boy, right? So. TSM, and then outside of that, I'm really just waiting to kind of see where the rosters, I guess, kind of land. But overall, again, mostly excited just to see Sentinels continue to perform. Yeah, and it'll just be curious if they can carry that kind of, you know, if they're going to be able to gap these non-NA teams in the same way that they just did this past week. Because they looked, I mean, 100 Thieves, that's a good roster, right? Some big names on there, Austin, Hiko, and the rest. Inconsistent, <laughs> right? that, yeah. that, that Oh, man, Hiko other thing. just right. wasn't holding it down. So... You know, am I entirely surprised that they just got bodied by Sentinels? No, but like they had some shiny moments though. Mm -hmm. It was like they had definitely had some turnaround times where they were just—I feel like they were getting bodied the whole time. And then I know where they'd be like, "We're on, we're on," and then just <laughs> nope. All right, we're back off now. Yeah. So they definitely have it, but they're just not as, not consistent enough. But I, I'll say like some more time, and that roster could probably get figured out. Yeah, the good thing is that they do have at least a, a few more months here to try and figure things out. The other thing to note, though, you talk about TSM. With the way that they actually went out in the Stage 3 playoffs, Ugh. they need one of the North American teams to win at Masters for them to have a shot to go to the World Championship. So if one of the North American teams doesn't win, their 2021 season is done. Brutal. If they do, it earns NA an extra spot at the World Championship in November, and then that gives them the spot to play through in the LCQ. Ooh. Now, and even then, right... Still not guaranteed. You have to perform at the LCQ, and you didn't show up very well because they got o 2 would Yep, hard. In right their away. series, right, see you later. In, in, in this playoff. So we'll see how it turns out. But that's the right side of things. I want to talk Smash. Oh, okay. I know you're a big Smash guy. We got a lot of big Smashers here in the office, and we've been talking about it a lot. It's been a huge discussion on Twitter over the last couple of weeks, and it is the Smash Summit 3 voting obviously smash summit coming up and uh, summit is and it crosses multiple titles right you do cs summit there's smash and other games one of the coolest esports events out there period and what have your thoughts been on this whole voting system that's been going on over the last couple of weeks well it's it's just crazy it always is crazy i would say that the one the most recent one um i enjoyed more Okay. I feel like in previous iterations, I'm not sure if it's because there was a break for COVID and now it's kind of coming back and people are appreciating it more, whatever it is. I really do feel like in the past, it's been kind of toxic. You know what I mean? I feel like people would like get really upset about things. Mm -hmm. and, and But I feel like this time it was actually like, it was pretty wholesome. Like everybody was just rallying behind all their favorite people. Like there was a lot of like community driven winners, which I think yeah. is really cool. You know, like you get these hidden bosses or final bosses from like, um, just like random top King DD, DDD player from Florida who everyone rallies behind and yeah. like the whole scene pushes this um, this player to um, summit because they're like, 
like our region mm -hmm. thinks that he's our top player or knows like this kid's our top player and he could get in there and like really represent, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really cool to see a lot of like newcomers be able to like rally with their community and be able to go to an event like this when mm -hmm. normally you would just see, you know, the top 25 players or whatever sure. it is, right? Because, you know, with the, with the online scene, obviously there's a lot of like lesser known players being able to, you know, climb to the spotlight because not obviously not everyone can travel all the time, but everyone can really play online all the time. Yeah. Um, so... I think it's obviously super cool. Um, there's a lot of awesome players that got in. Void, of course, um, whom, whom I voted Friend for. Friend of the show. We'll Friend say. of the show, for sure. <laughs> uh, Void, obviously, was awesome. Let's go Void uh, to see him slide in there and, and get in. I know Charlie the King um, got in there today. A and, big player in our, and in our locals here. I mean, we've seen him at yeah. a ton of, uh, you know, there's a night smash events at esports arena over the years in Santa Ana. So even like Wadi got in as like a backup, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like it's just cool to see obviously all these different players come through. But then also like I said, like the random players who I wouldn't, I wouldn't say random players again. I'm not as well. But not those with. big names that you talk yeah, about. Yeah, not those, large like, scale influencers, 25. more sure. local heroes. I think as mm -hmm. I would put them, right? So you got like the Aaron's and the um, you know Co I know Cola's going, who's newly picked up by the new esports team that I'm sure we'll touch on here in a few. Yeah. Um, but overall, I, I you know I, I had a blast watching it. I think that the crowdfunding component of it is ludicrous mm -hmm. because um you know these people are literally like getting like seventy thousand votes yeah and every every like two every dollar spent gets you like two votes or yeah. something so like to get seventy thousand votes is like in theory around thirty five thousand dollars of of prize funding yeah and the prize pool i think you said it was like 150 so the, the last time i checked the prize pool was over a hundred and fifty three thousand dollars and ninety three percent of that is crowdfunded. Which is crazy. Which is, yeah, that's awesome. And that's just like, to see that much community growth of it, and, mm -hmm. and too, it's just like people are buying merch to support this thing, which is super cool, right? Because a lot of those, you know, you can like buy merch and then you get points based on how much you buy, right? So it's not like all of the funds, you know, goes directly into the prize pool. It's cool that it's kind of split up to kind of, you know, obviously probably fund some of the production of the show to, you know, produce merch and actually give back to all the people who are donating and spending all their money. Um, and then obviously the coolest part of all of it is that the people who want to get in like, they, like, campaign. Yeah. You know, they're like, oh, if you guys give me this many votes, I'm going to do this crazy thing. I'm going to shave my head. I'm going to eat the hottest pepper. I'm going <laughs> to – I'll play games on stream. I'll do this. You know what I mean? Like, they just do whatever it is that makes sense for their community. So it's just a really cool experience. I think it's – I think it's – they nailed it this year. I, I didn't notice almost anything, like, negative around it, which, especially in the Smash scene, I feel like it's hard to do nowadays. So it was nice yeah. to just kind of see it unfold and to kind of see just everybody having a good time and, and getting behind their favorite players. So, yeah. I mean, one of the most unique lead-ups to one of the most unique esports events out there. Period. I mean, the Melee Summit was like blew everyone's mind. Yeah. So I'm really excited to see some more. And that was uh, Mango winning his first ever summit, uh, if if memory serves. I remember seeing the end of that set, and that was insane. It was a 10 game set with Zayn. I watched every game, <laughs> and it was it was a Just it was a nail. No, straight up, it <laughs> yeah. was crazy. It was like last hit, last stock, all the time. It was super hot. You love to see it. One mm. of the names you mentioned, Cola, actually does lead us into the next thing I want to talk about. And it is the man, the myth, the legend himself, Moist Critical, Ooh. getting into esports. Obviously, he's been in the gaming scene for a long time. I mean, I remember being, uh, you know, in the early days of YouTube watching his uh, Oregon Trail yeah. Let's Play, which is still uh, just one of my favorite YouTube videos of all time. And he's obviously been big in so many different parts of streaming and, and YouTube for years. His commentary is extremely popular. And now he has apparently created an esports team, uh, Moist Esports. And they've signed Cola, who is one of the, uh, the last player, along with Charlie the King, getting in through votes to Summit, which is crazy to think about. And such a cool name getting into the esports scene from an ownership side. What does it really mean to own an org? <laughs> you know, I feel like it. De it depends, right? Yeah. It's it's not the same. Because you, know, you take like I take like Ninja as an example, right? Because I follow Ninja pretty closely, mm -hmm. and he started his team. You know, his team Ninja. You mm -hmm. know, his whole vibe that he kind of has going on, um, and even his time in, right? Is yeah. that what he was calling it when he was like started that Valorant team? It was like called like, oh, yeah. Time In or something like that. And it's like you can name, you can call a group of people who play together, or like a specific player or two that you sponsor whatever you want. You sure. can have them put whatever they want in front of them and you can release merch and I can change my app. But like, what does it really, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like without like owning a, like a slot or like a, a team in something like larger, I feel like it's more of like a gaming 
brand rather than like um, you know you can do you kind of know what I'm saying? It's like I just feel like it's I like do. they made all this like super crazy announcements. I guess I'm just yeah. excited to see what he does with it because he obviously could go crazy big. I think it depends. It depends on a bunch of factors. I think you make a good point when you're talking about owning a slot in a league or something like that. Though I don't necessarily think that should be like. And I don't think you're trying to say this. I don't think that should be like a hard line of, of course like, not, yeah. if you don't, you're not an order, right? Yeah. I, I think it depends on what is your goal in terms of creating this org. Is it, are you, and there's nothing wrong with like trying to make money, but it's like, is this just a, a business venture? You're just trying yeah, to get you just in and get some back cash. to the community, trying to support yeah. players, right? You do know, you want make to, some cool merch for your Do you fans? want to build a name and try and build out a team? Are you trying to, you know, something like we're trying to do a Series E? Are you trying to build up the next level of talent? Right. Um, you know, I think your goals matter. And then what spaces you're getting into. And I think that's the, the big difference when you talk about owning a spot in the league is like, what games do you want to get into? Because I think that greatly changes things, right? Panda Global is an esports org, right? But they don't own any spots, but they're big at like fighting games and stuff right, like right, that. Right. So I think they're, it, it's a very kind of amorphous thing when you talk about owning an org. And I think as long as you know, I don't necessarily care about like the label. If somebody wants to call themselves an esports org owner, I'm not going to be like, oh, no, you're not. Sure, but I'm also yeah. not going to give a fuck about your ownership unless I feel like you're doing something good in some form, whether it is for the community, whether it's for the players and teams that you have yeah, under your umbrella. Yeah, because about a good 2,000 orgs. Sure. I mean, you could call me an esports org owner because I made an amateur League of Legends team a couple of years ago, and I have a logo for them and a name. Like you could technically I didn't call know me you were an, an org owner. Yes, technically had to, at Havoc. Actually, that is where we, <laughs> those videos were. So we, funny. we won't talk about, but so that is where funny. Havoc comes from. Oh. Is I have a I have a logo and everything and mm. stuff just for an amateur league that I played in. But, but I, I think it's super cool to see influencers or content creators, but rather supporting. Mm -hmm. um, top players yes. through various methods and they can rep themselves through that. I think that's all super cool and like not trying to put any negativity towards that piece specifically. Sure. I just think it's funny to have like, you know, <laughs> all the big esports news articles like panic write an article about <laughs> Critical making his own esports and I'm just sitting here like, he just, he's like just paying Cola to go to Summit yeah. and rep his name. Like, and for I, me, I, I'm like, it, just, it, it just feels like bad. Yeah. I guess it just feels more like bad reporting than anything but like whatever. Yeah. I, and for me, if, like, was funny. if there was anybody to do something like that that I'd be hyped for, I'm like, yeah. And he's, like, he's, Critical's the homie. Like, I love too, it. The whole for voiced sure. meme, you know? I love yes, it. It's great. What a terrible experience to say. <laughs> Just the, new, the newly go watch, moist cola. Go watch some episodes of the moist meter. It does support <laughs> our boy Critical. I love it. Let's go Critical. Oh, man. Okay. Uh, next thing we got to talk about is Blizzard and the Overwatch oh, League. God. And it has been a dumpster fire for weeks <laughs> on so many different fronts. Yeah. Um, obviously, uh, you know, it's a little late for us to talk at length about the lawsuit. If you're watching, you likely know what's going on on that front. If you don't, just look up the Blizzard lawsuit and kind of get yourself up to date. We aren't going to go super in depth with what's going on there, but some of the fallout is happening. Um, and part of that is sponsors seemingly pulling out left and right from the Overwatch League. Uh, we got apparently Kellogg's is out. T-Mobile, State Farm, and Coca-Cola as well. And it, it's just, I mean, Blizzard and the Overwatch League in a really tough spot right now. Yeah, I can't say too much on a couple of those po uh, components, but yep. I, I definitely was speaking with some involved parties um, and just kind of showing them some new things we have coming up. And, and they were just kind of like, yeah, I know I really like this because, you know, it's, it doesn't lock us into like a specific... Uh, like situation where sure. you know if, if X happens, then we'd have all our eggs in one basket. And I was like, "Whatever could you mean?" Like I was, you know <laughs> I, mean? like, I was kind of in one of those situations on a, on, a, on a sales pitch earlier this week, and and it's just like it's so brutal mm -hmm. um, to see just like so much so much animosity around you know to me especially like such a um, a classic community from yeah. the esports sector or even the gaming sector in general, right? World of Warcraft, Starcraft 2, all that kind of stuff. And it's just kind of filling the, all of the different voids with it. So that's definitely not been great. I know that... Um, are we going to talk about the McCree thing? Is that part of this? That's, we'll, we'll talk about that, that later, but that is, is... So it's, yeah, seeing all the, just the different news come out, it's, it's definitely brutal on the business side specifically. 
it's all pretty low low key, right? Like the sponsors aren't necessarily like announcing it. It's more mm -hmm. like the branding is just disappearing, which is kind of interesting too, right? Because yeah. like who wants to really talk about it, right? So I'm not really sure what's going to happen. I don't even know if the Overwatch League's going on. They sold out to YouTube so long ago, so no one so, even really remembers like when they <laughs> when they stream. So. Right. Uh, and the other thing too is Overwatch Two has been it's just uh, clouded in mystery for so long, and then a report came out uh, recently saying that the Overwatch League could potentially go on a one year hiatus. Uh, their global finals happen uh, next month. I think it's September 25th. And apparently, oh. apparently <laughs> uh, there were reports that the, you know, the league ops team had gone to teams and told them that the next season may not start until well into the fall of 2022 because apparently they would want them to be able to play on the new game. Now, mm. uh, I believe the commissioner of the Overwatch League has come out and denied these reports, so I, I do want to clarify that. They have come out and said there has been there is nothing to those rumors that they've said anything like this to the teams, but it just seems like so on so many different fronts, Blizzard is in hot water all over the place. So, like, November is a pretty key time period for Blizzard in past years, right? They have right. BlizzCon that would normally happen the first... Um, weekend of November every year, and yeah. that's really where they would release all their gaming news every year, right? Mm -hmm. And especially, you know, you would usually expect a couple game launches, or kind of depending on what year it was, right? Like, you know, you kind of know what to expect. Diablo 4 and Overwatch 2 should be around pretty soon, you know what I mean? So it's like, it, there's, there's reason to believe that they could announce and or release these games for holiday this year. I don't think Overwatch 2 is coming this year. You don't think so? I think a lot of reports that I have seen indicate that Overwatch 2 is not close, mm -hmm. at least, you know, not within eight to ten months of coming out. And so, so and I, was, I think I that is... I was playing is, these games two years ago. <laughs> so it just seems odd to me that... I, I agree. They wouldn't be... You know, I know they're getting bodied and It whatnot, feels like they but, should be close. I completely yeah, agree yeah, there, yeah. but it just doesn't seem... And, you know, for me it would... I think it makes sense that they would want to time the Overwatch League, especially around the release of the new game, because you know yeah, that's the biggest finals, part. Yeah, like. that's the biggest part of like these esports leagues is it's supposed to be in the end. A lot of these developers look at it as it's an advertisement for their game. It's another 100%. product to put out there to encourage people to come and play their game. So it would make sense if you're nearing the release of the sequel, you would want to run an entirely new Overwatch season on the old title that's going to cross over the release of the new one. So I think that makes sense, but it just seems to me like there's a disconnect here and wires are getting crossed left and right and the timings just may not be lining up and it may be a very awkward release with these kind of schedules laying on top of each other for everything that's going on. I don't know. It's weird. We'll see. And again, the report's unconfirmed. The commissioner of the Overwatch League came out and said no... No year-long hiatus. We haven't talked about that, but I just thought with the reports that have been coming out around Overwatch 2, I'm like, that, you know, seems mildly credible. Whatever, guys. Apparently, there's an Overwatch League that runs every week. <laughs> did, and, you, did you know this? And apparently, there, <laughs> and apparently, Worlds is next month, guys, so shape up and pay attention. <laughs> A lot of stuff going on there. Uh, one thing that you're going to notice that we love to talk about here. Uh, because I know Luke is a big fan, is the numbers. The numbers game, mm. Luke is a big numbers man. Hit me with the numbers. And I want to hit you with some numbers. Mobile gaming oh continues to pop off, and specifically mobile shooters. I got a couple of numbers for you here. Call of Duty Mobile is quote-unquote on track to make more than $1 billion in 2021. That's terrible. PUBG Mobile reportedly made nearly $300 million in July alone. What is Ludicrous. just your kind of first mm. blush reaction so, to this? It's so crazy, dude. Like mobile, China, man. It's, mobile, it's China. Mean, yes. so, but it's, it's funny, too, right? Because, like, the Chinese government hates mobile gaming. You <laughs> I know mean, what I mean? Gaming in general. Ga gaming like, in general, but yes. mobile gaming specifically yeah. also, right? Like, but, you know, definitely an untapped or an undertapped market in North mm. America, for sure, that I feel like is going to just grow bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's, there's a couple really powerful orgs and influencers in the North American space that I've been kind of looking into a decent amount because I do believe that 
you know, mobile gaming has a lot of potential, mm -hmm. um, just with the accessibility of it. Yeah. You know, there's so many roadblocks with, you know, setting up a, a console or a, a computer or even being able to... Even, especially as the price points go up. Totally, but even in your own house, that's one thing. But, mm -hmm. like, again, it's, you know, engaging with people, mm -hmm. right? Being able to go to a place and, and compete with your friends, right, is one... one thing but also being able to like go to a park and play on your switch or your phone or mm -hmm. be in class or on recess playing brawl stars or clash royale or whatever it is that you play or PUBG, whatever yeah um i think it's pretty cool i mean frank kelly obviously our, our coo mm -hmm. plays PUBG mobile all the time even with his kids and all yeah. that kind of stuff so i i'm i'm pretty i've been pretty in, interested in mobile gaming i think that you know the, where the funds are coming from is like blowing my mind i guess a little bit if, it, if it's mostly microtransactions mm -hmm. or if it's just like them selling ads through the through you know the the app store and whatnot, yeah. but just the the sheer number of players is no way they were expecting it to be that successful to the point where it's almost like battle royales now where everyone was like oh my god people like battle royales everybody make one yeah literally right now everybody's making a mobile app yeah. every single game developer for every single IP that they have Apex Legends is reportedly nearing getting uh, a release on mobile as well but the problem is with everyone making mobile apps and with everyone making battle royales. Mm -hmm. Who's going to succeed and who's going to fail, right? Obviously, you have a, maybe Call a, of Duty and PUBG at the moment. You have these IPs, right, that mm -hmm. maybe really hold their value and weight, and mm. you know maybe the IP alone can carry it, but like, there's no way that they all can. Yeah. So I, I guess it's just going to be one of those things where you know people are going to invest millions of dollars into developing these mobile apps, and like some are going to flop and some are going to make a billion dollars. Yeah. The weird, the the thing that oddly took me like much longer to kind of connect the dots on uh, than I feel like it should have was the fact that mobile gaming it can be the successor to like the handheld consoles of when we were kids, Game, Game Boys, Boy DS, yeah, and all definitely. that kind of stuff. The Make one thing that friends. like, the, the one thing that kind of gates me, and there is, I play some mobile games, but the thing that gates me is I don't feel like I get titles from mobile games like I got when I was a kid, right? There's nothing like Pokemon on mobile unless you're emulating like a Pokemon title. And I feel like it has, there has been a very specific mindset to developing mobile games, um, you know, outside of titles that have been, you know, maybe indie titles that have been made on PC or something and then have been ported to mobile, that it doesn't feel like they're really scratching the itch of those older, former uh, handheld console players of the Game Boys and stuff like that. I'm really hoping that we start to see that in the mobile space because I feel like once we really can hit that outside of, you know, there's always going to be your gotcha games, your loot box shooters and stuff like that, your Call of Duties and whatever coming to that space. But I really want to see some interesting and creative development on the mobile front that I feel like is, for me, feels untapped at this point. And I think that is really, that's going to be when I jump into mobile gaming because I do it here and there now, but it's never been something that I'm like, yes, I really want to play these games on my phone. I'm more like, I'd rather go grab my 3DS and play Alpha Sapphire right now. But, it, yeah, see, I kind of hear what you're saying on the itch that you're kind of looking for them to scratch, but that's not the itch that's going to make them money. And, and I hear that. Yeah. And that's why I may never get into mobile gaming because it may never be enough of an incentive to hit that. So I feel like there's only two reasons that they're making a mobile game. One is to help different audiences engage with their specific IP. Because yes. if you, right now, were to list off any top 25 popular IP in the yeah. world... I guarantee there's a mobile game attached to it. Almost 100%. Mm -hmm. There's some kind of mobile game that if you type in your favorite IP in, this, in the app store, it's going to pop up and you can download it, whether it's your favorite things in anime or if it's music or if it's... Um, uh, Minecraft you know, or Call sure, of Duty. Sure, a specific game mm -hmm. or if it's you know an old school game, whatever it is, there's an app for it. I yeah. promise it's there. Go to the app store. Tell yeah. me I'm wrong, right? So that's step one. The other piece is the microtransaction component, yeah. right? Where it's like, they want you to be able to, they want the replayability to keep you coming back yep. to continue to make micro purchases inside the game. So it's like, if it's not hitting one of those two pieces, it's like probably no one's developing it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, or you're going to find the people who do have built in emulators mm -hmm. who are like, Oh, I want to itch that scratch here. I built you an emulator and you can play any game you want from mm -hmm. the 1995 <laughs> to 2005 genre of Game yeah. Boy Advance. Right. So, um, Kind of hear what you're saying there, but definitely uh, it's it's exciting just to kind of see people continue to develop the mobile space. I mean, one of the very first events Esports Arena ever hosted and ran was a the Winter Championships for Vainglory back in like 2015. Oh, gee. And that was like 
OG mobile gaming. Mm -hmm. Like, who was running physical giant lands, let alone having winter championships for mobile games in 2015, especially in North America? Yeah. Nobody. <laughs> so, um, you know, it was pretty cool to Pioneers. see. Pioneers. Yeah, literally. Yeah. Van Van well, Vainglory was. We were just the venue. Yeah. Um, but nonetheless, um, so, I, I mean, it's it feels like it hasn't really changed much i guess mm -hmm. since then so you know i'm just excited to you know obviously a billion dollars is crazy that's just all numbers and scale so we'll see where it goes yeah really interesting year there next thing to talk about is nick Merckx. he's been oh. jumping into the apex scene recently yep. uh, expanding his game titles but one big announcement we saw was his partnership with under armor and if you are watching the youtube vod you can actually see his promo playing right now, his partnership with Under Armour, which is super cool. Um, but for those of you just listening, uh, it was just a short video. You can check it out on his social media, just pulling together the MFAM logo and the Under Armour logo. But it, this is a huge partnership. I mean, this is an extremely well-known, popular brand, especially in the traditional sports uh, space. And seeing a big name like Nick Merckx, partnering with a brand of this caliber is crazy and it just it's the continued progression of gaming starting to jump into all different aspects of our lives that's a cool one i mean mm -hmm. cool brand definitely don't really see it too often in the esports space they might be a jersey partner of somebody yeah I, I can't necessarily know i know off the top of my head but is was there any details as far as like what the partnership was going to entail or dollars they, there haven't been su there haven't been a ton of details on that front that's been pretty under wraps nick was just saying, you know, there's some really exciting stuff going on. You guys are going to be shocked, but there hasn't been any kind of hard details on it. But Because I always wonder with that if it's like, is it mostly collab stuff where yeah. they're just like, he's a big fan of Under Armour, so he wanted to like do collab merch with them. And it's mostly like um, kind of, you know, merch split and that kind yeah. of jazz with a mixture of, hey, I'm a giant streamer and then well, throw my logo on some stuff. Well, and the big thing too, right, is Nick is obviously a dude who has been so big about fitness and working out. He does a ton of workout streams. Uh, so it feels like Under Armour probably found the most perfect fit for them the in terms of jumping into, yeah, the streaming and gaming Surprised space. Surprised they didn't go after, like, Courage or Tim the Tap Man. I don't know. <laughs> um, that's cool, though. You know, good for Nick Merckx. You know, I, yeah. I, uh, I've definitely talked to him and his team a, a couple times, and uh, they're super smart. I've, you know, great faith that they worked out an incredible deal for uh, for Nick and... Um, I'm excited, I guess, to see what the um, what the collabs look like. Because I can't say I've been a huge fan of a lot of large game personalities merch collabs. So uh, <laughs> we'll, see, we'll see how Nick does. I have faith in him. Luke has been burned a couple of times. I've been burned times. a couple of times. <laughs> so that's really cool. Uh, one of our final things we want to talk about here is a little bit of crypto news. We're not going to get into the weeds oh, God. in what's going on in crypto because I'm not even the most well-versed on the subject. Turntable of the day. That's what yeah. this section's called. <laughs> right? What a joke. <laughs> um, but a big announcement we saw uh, a couple of weeks ago was the LCS. We talked about them earlier. Obviously, they have our playoffs going on right now. The LCS lands a seven-year sponsorship deal with FTX. Uh, and they are the first crypto exchange partner of any Riot League. So they have sponsored the North American League. If you watch any of the shows now for the LCS, they have the little FTX gold lead tracker on the screen at all times. And uh, this is a really interesting partnership specifically because TSM signed what I, if my memory serves, a $210 million naming rights deal over 10 years with FTX. So they are now TSM FTX, except in any Riot sponsor league, because Riot's, Riot was like, nope, you can't have your name changed like that in our leagues for their rules, and then you can't have FTX on any of their uh, jerseys. So a really interesting spot the LCS kind of puts themselves in there. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I actually listened to... Um a lot of like you know interviews and, and just people talking about this this story because I thought it was so funny just mm -hmm. to see them hard gate TSM to an extent sure right but then also make a deal of their own yeah but then also show the logo on the screen but then to also yeah. say out like to publicly state that it doesn't change their stance and that they're going to still yes. remove the branding in regions where uh, crypto isn't acceptable or whatever and so what it seems to be 
is, we talked about they don't like games very much earlier. Uh, seems like China also, they're not big fans of crypto as well. And obviously, t uh, you know, Tencent, big Chinese company, owns Riot Games. So it would seem that this is likely based around the ability for them to be able to remove any of this branding uh, in any sort of Chinese broadcast and stuff like that. And I guess it is... Which they already Easier, do, right? Because right. they multicast to different regions yes. already. So it's not like it's probably that much of an extra leap for them yeah. to have different assets because they probably already just do. Yeah. So definitely not, it's not that weird. But, you know, one, I'm excited to see how much it's for because I bet mm -hmm. it's more than $210 million. Which is, you know, nothing to sneeze at. Nothing to sneeze at, but maybe. And then also, this is another piece that I heard some other people having a conversation around is, what do you think that, like, the cash to crypto uh, payment is like? Like, what if you think they're paying like two hundred ten million dollars in cryptocurrency, or do you think that uh, it's? Do, do you kind of know what I mean? So obviously, yeah, you, right. Obviously, you like, can't know the answer, right? Sure. And, and it's there's, you know, it's not public, whatever it is. But you know, it just interests me because you know, FTX probably has plenty of FTX to toss around. Yeah, you know what I mean? Where it's just like two hundred ten million in crypto deal. Here you go, and then yeah. it's just like. It's the same to us. Like, we can convert it, we can keep it, we can invest it, whatever, right? So, I guess I'm just curious. You know, it's hard to obviously tell, but one, I'm pretty sure Riot got paid more, and I'm excited to see what the, when the number comes out. I mean, the reach is bigger, right? I mean, you do get on board with TSM with the one of the biggest esports orgs in the world across almost every title, yep. right? But then you look at the LCS, and it is... That's hard. I, I want to argue that it's bigger, but it is only the North American League, right? It's not like it's all right. Riot broadcast. It's just LCS. But I don't so, know, because TSM is, is like twice the size of the next largest esports org. For sure. Like, no one is close to them. Yeah. They dominate, like, every category. The only other squad that you can look at internationally that's maybe close is, like, a T1, but they don't necessarily have, close, like, the breadth of exactly like, titles that, that TSM yeah. is in. So it's they a, just own they own the largest influencers in literally every scene. Yeah. Because they just buy the funniest, coolest dude, and they just call it a day. And they or just the on. biggest trash talker. Yeah, whichever find, one, dude. Right? See, it it's works both way. ways. That's yeah. just the TSM way. Mm -hmm. um, but super funny. I'm excited to see how it pans yeah. out, and I can't wait to see when the numbers come out. Because yeah. it'll be ex extremely fun to break down. Yeah, it is... It's an easy thing at first blush to be like, oh, right, what is this? But I think when you break it down and think about it, it makes sense to an extent. And obviously, Riot, I mean, with, you know, and again, we can only speculate to yeah. how much money it is, but Riot was probably looking down the barrel. What do you of, think? More or least, less? I think more. I think Me they're too. looking at at least probably $400 million, I would mm -hmm. imagine, over seven years. Um, you know, and even, even, if, it, even if, it's, if it's, say, theoretically a little less, you're still looking at, you know, maybe close to $200 million over seven years. I don't think there's any reason why Riot is going, yeah, I think this will fit in our rules. I think we can make this work. Just to slap your, your logo. And, I mean, it's it works out for uh, FTX in the end. Obviously, they've spent a ton of money. But while they didn't get their name in TSM's name in the Riot, you know, broadcast, and it's not going to show up on their jersey, they're still going to be Literally, they're permanently on the screen during every single LCS game for the next seven years. I wonder how much that means. You know, it's so interesting, right? Because you take a look at, like, you know, does it make more sense to sponsor influencers and teams mm -hmm. and players, or does it make more sense to put all your eggs into one specific game and let it just run? You yeah, know, so, it like, depends on the service, right? Yeah. That's what it depends on. It is what what is it that you're trying to sell? And it would seem like for FTX, as a, you know, it's a crypto exchange site. And service, I would think they're probably getting more reach out of getting to those bigger umbrellas, the teams, the orgs, uh, and the leagues. It probably better serves them as a brand. So I bet their ROI is better through TSM than it would ever be for the LCS. Because like Myth talking about FTX compared to the LCS running an ad, you know? Yeah. So I don't know. I'm starting to think that maybe TSM is more. It's possible. It's possible. And I'm just know. like I'm like weighing numbers. I'm in just my like head, I'm just like Jacob reach. Wolf. Where are you at? I need some numbers. Yeah, here. seriously. I need, I, I, need some, I need some in depth reports. Hopefully, next week's one. episode we can dive into it more and there's more information. I would love out, to hear more about it. We'll see. Um, all right. So the final thing that I want to talk about today, and Luke mentioned it earlier in the show, uh, and we are circling back to the Blizzard topic as there has been a push 
from the Overwatch community to get the name changed of McCree, who is a character in Overwatch, who is obviously, uh, and not obviously, but is named after an employee at Blizzard who was recently fired and was, uh, in fact, named as part of the lawsuit that is going on with Blizzard right now. And there's been this big push to change the name, and Asmongold uh, actually had an opinion on it. And I want to quote uh, one of the things that he said on tw his stream the other day. He said, I hope they don't change McCree's name in Overwatch. Like, that, in my opinion, would just be stupid. I don't want to see them change McCree's name. McCree is an existing character with a narrative around it. The Alec, uh, uh, and apologies if I mispronounce his name, uh, Alex Afraziaba. FN NPCs have no nuance around them. It's just like a character with his name. So if you do that, I just think that it's weird. It's like you're trying to hide it. You're retconning things in order to look like this is not what happened. What is your thoughts on pulling the name or not? Do you agree with Asmogold? I'm curious what you think. Okay, well, first of all, for reference, like this guy was essentially in the, in the Cosby suite photo. If you guys aren't familiar with that, apparently there was like a, you know, in a Blizzard event a while ago, and there was like a suite of a bunch of executives holding like a, a literal picture of Bill Cosby over their heads, like all smiling. And yeah. it was after all the stuff had happened. Mm -hmm. Like after all the Bill Cosby stuff came out. So yes. Was, first of all, very, very little taste there. Yeah. Like, I don't, I, swing and a miss. Um, and then you put that into the context of the whole else situation. That is reportedly exactly happening with the company. that. It's way, way It's worse. actually just like, Gross and terrifying. Yes. So with that piece being said, obviously, um, get that guy out of here. Yes. Step one, right? But then it's like now that guy's last name is McCree. Yes. Right? So that guy's name is the fictional character. But mm -hmm. I'm also sure there's other McCrees in the world. And I'm sure there's other, you know, Ashes in the world and other Gibraltars in the world, etc. Right? So it's, I'd say where my head's at, I'm kind of agreeing with Asm Asmogold. I think it's a little weird to change the name, especially since there's like plenty of... Uh, lack of better terms, younger generation kids, whatever you want to call it, who um, identify with McCree, like McCree, McCree's a favorite character, whatever it might be, and they don't know anything that's going on. It doesn't matter at all, especially Overwatch, mm -hmm. which definitely targets a younger demographic. It, it, se it seems like a little bit of a... Of a it, it would seem like I probably wouldn't recommend it because I'd be thinking more about that than I would be that it represents something along the lines of the lawsuit. Because it's sure. like, well, how can you ever change it without... Like, I, I just don't know how they would do it in any kind of normal way. And also, Blizzard didn't even, like, officially release that, you know, it's not like they were like, hey, stop saying McCree or whatever it is, right? It's the commentators of the Overwatch League, Bren and uh, Sideshow, yes. who just decided that they didn't no longer wanted to utilize the McCree name, started sure. calling him the cowboy on broadcast, yeah. and Blizzard made a statement saying, like, this is not an official Blizzard thing, like, they just did it themselves, whatever it is, right? So it, it's like... I don't know, to, for the community to kind of come up and be like, yo, we don't want to use the McCree name anymore is like, I get it, and it makes yeah. sense, it makes complete sense. But it's also like, what about all like the fan base? Like the, you know, I don't know. I guess, I guess I'm, I, I, under, I understand both sides. I just, I, I'm just more thinking about who cares that the name is McCree, and I feel like the majority of the people would be, you know, whoever is McCree is their favorite character, and that's probably sure. mostly kids. I think... I think I there know. are good points on both sides. I talked myself out of both sides I like think, a bunch yeah. of times, so I, I, I guess I didn't come to a conclusion. I think that the pro, I, I think a lot of the reason and where the community is coming from is the character is named for the employee as a celebration of that employee, right? That's why it's named that way. And when you find out later down the line that, oh... Maybe this isn't someone that we would want to celebrate because of X, Y, and Z. What they've done, what has come to light. And then it, it, I think from the community perspective, it's we shouldn't celebrate this individual. They should not have this place in this title that has a, so, you know, uh, a place in so many people's hearts. And I think there is you know, an argument to be like, you know, it's so well established or whatever. But at the same right. time, I think for me, the immediate connection that I made was to... Um, the controversy that has happened over the last few years over Confederate statues and sure. street names and building names named after people from the Civil War. And I think it is in a similar vein, and I'm not trying to, uh, you know, directly one-to-one -one conflate these two, two uh, issues, but it feels like the, uh, the, the situation is very similar. I disagree with 
uh, Asmigold trying to characterize it as retconning because I don't think it's like we completely wipe it from all the Overwatch history books, right? The wiki is not allowed to say that he was ever called McCree. You can't talk about him ever being called McCree. But I think pushing the character into a new space and changing the name, I think, tries to shift the character away from the origin that isn't as nice. And I think you can, I think you can do that and still acknowledge that this is where it came from and this is what he used to be named, but also say that person is not someone that we want to celebrate any longer and for that reason we want to change the name. I thought of three great ideas that they could do. Yes. My first idea is they write in the storyline where essentially McCree dies and like his, <laughs> and, and, his and, and, but, and, then, and then a cowboy replaces him and has a different name. It's a clone. It's a clone, <laughs> yeah. right? Number two would be they get him married and they take the spouse's uh, last name. Oh, okay. They could, they could even write in a whole LGBT vibe in there and, okay, and get him a whole okay. different last name. Great idea. The amount of now, fan the third one, right now. Now the third one that I think is the real banger is yeah. they completely reskin him to all American USA flag stuff and they rename him McFree. <laughs> It's just one letter. It's so easy. Nailed it, just nailed it, and nailed it. That's three for three. You're welcome, Blizzard. Take some notes. This is, um, this is why Luke just is on the business <laughs> side of Esports Arena. I can't just... even believe I, I thought of all three of those great ideas while you were talking yeah. about it. Because um, in all reality, I mean, again, I would see either way, yeah. whichever direction they do. We'll see, like, there's a lot more underlying issues here than, you know, a sure. specific character's name. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like drawing additional attention to the issue by stopping to say the character's name is also a pretty, you know, it worked, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So it's, again, an, another way to kind of put additional um, gas on the fire, if you will, of making sure that these issues get handled and don't go under the rug. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely a um, an interesting, you know, decision on, on Brennan's side shows side. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I definitely don't discount that at all because obviously it took a lot to do it. Mm -hmm. It was just, you know, without, especially without the bite in the hand that feeds you, if you will. Well, and especially when you look at the history of Blizzard esports specifically it's not too long ago that we had the hong kong protests going on and everything Good that times. happened with uh with that on on that uh hearthstone stream mm. right so like blizzard has a history of not handling these situations well and definitely uh you know putting yourself kind of in the line of fire there to an extent but standing up for something you believe in is not an easy decision. So I've come to the conclusion that McFree is the correct play. McFree, there you go. Blizzard, you can have that one for McFree. Wouldn't be uh, the first thing. Never mind. <laughs> Luke's gonna table that one. Yeah, I'm gonna table that one for a post show one. discussion. Uh -huh. We'll talk about that one off camera. <laughs> uh, awesome. That's gonna do it uh, for our first ever episode of Eat, Speak, Compete. Uh, again, if you guys have any input, any questions you guys want to ask us, jump in on the discussion. Make sure to hit us both up on Twitter. Again, Luke is at Shimonahi on Twitter. I am at Caster Yeso. We would love to hear from you guys. Make sure to follow us on all of our socials. You actually should have been able to see those uh, on the left side of your screen. So check us out on Twitter, YouTube, all of that good stuff. And then if there are any podcast platforms that you like, I know we talked about earlier, Apple Podcasts and Spotify are the big ones. We want to get on those platforms as soon as possible. But if there's other ones that you prefer, make sure to let us know. Any final thoughts, Luke, before we close the show? Um, final thoughts? No. Fun first episode. Mm -hmm. uh, we got a, a big week ahead of us. As always, it's Pop-Tarts week, so that's pretty cool. Make yes. sure you guys tune into some uh, Series Z action. Uh, outside of that, you know, we're always... We're doing our TikTok grind. If you guys are big content people in yes. general, we're pretty much at Esports Arena on every single platform. Yeah. So come and hang out with us. We love making goofy TikToks, especially in the anime field. So if you guys are anime fans, head over there. Um, any games you're playing this week, JC? Any games I'm playing. Back for Blood Alpha is done, or Beta okay. is done. So uh, that one's out the door. Sad about that. Playing Apex. I'm trying to grind for Platinum hmm. uh, this season. That is the focus dabbling a little bit back into League of Legends as well. Nothing really new on the front. I think I'm going to jump back into Valorant. Watching uh, the VCT playoffs made me really want to get back and pick up that Vandal again and, and, and start playing. You mean Phantom? I mean... You mean Phantom? For me, it's... so. Were you watching the playoffs? You mean Phantom? Uh, so I play both guns in very specific situations. Sure. Defense, I'm typically Phantom holding corners and just getting the spray. Um, if I'm having to peek at range, what like I'm doing at attack, I prefer the Vandal on that front for like those one-tap headshots, if I can get them. Trust me, I'm not like consistently but hitting But didn't they those. change the damage on Vandal so it's not a one-tap kill in all distance anymore? Uh, I think they have. 
they yeah. have. It's been a little while. It's like since only I played it's only long distance. But I'm like now, I'm right? weird. I and and definitely if I start a game, offense or defense, right? And I'm playing with Phantom or Fandle, Fant, Vandal or Phantom. Wow. Um, and it's not working out. I'll just switch. I'll be like, I'm not hitting my shots here. I just got to change the gun. We'll see if we can change my my luck, and I'll do that. So, uh, have you been playing anything recently? What what have you been up to? Honestly, I've been playing too much. I've been playing a little bit of Pokemon Unite still, just trying oh, to get trying to help I'm Kyle in. get to Masters. Yes. I've been I've been I've just been Masters for so long that it's like, <laughs> you know, and, and and honestly, it's just like a general consensus that once you hit Masters, you don't play anymore. So right, you just um, sit on that rank. No, literally, there's no reason. Like it's terrible. Yeah. You know? So I'm really hoping for some balance changes coming out here. I'm really hoping for some new characters to come out. Like I'm I'm just looking for some love. But hey, it's Nintendo, so what do you expect? It had a good run though. I had a blast playing it while it was fun. <laughs> I love um, it. It had a good run. We aren't even like two months in. Yeah. Yet. Hey, dude. That's you take what you get nowadays. Sure. Because it sure, was sure. some fun. And then outside of that, really, I'm playing a little bit of Hearthstone, just kind of in my free time, just here and there, because okay. um, you know that's where my roots are. So don't hate me, world. But um, but yeah, overall, haven't been haven't been gaming too much, and, and maybe I'll have to jump on some Valorant games with you this week. All right. Sounds like that's it. Though. That's all I got. See you later. Yeah. Hit us up, guys. Uh, 4 p.m. Pacific time, both Tuesday and Wednesday for Series Z Apex Legends. We'll have our Pokemon TCG stream this Thursday as oh! well. That's 5 p.m. Pacific time for that one. And we'll have our final circle recap show on Friday at 5 p.m. as well. So that's everything going on here. Hope you guys enjoyed the show. First episode of Eat, Speak, Compete in the books. We'll see you guys later. Bye. Bye. See you later. Bye.